So I thought that we would begin in the book of John chapter 11. No, I don't have my holidays mixed up. This is, <laughs> this is the chapter we, we normally will peruse or refer to uh, at Easter time, right? Mm -hmm. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Um, the fact of Jesus here, he's telling us who he is. In the light of his friend Lazarus dying and entombed. And he's criticized throughout this, this uh, time. His uh, own disciples half mock him. Lord, if he sleeps, he'll be doing well. <laughs> the old doubter Thomas. And um, uh, our Lord has a plan. You know, there's something worse than death. It's unbelief. That's something this chapter brings out. There's something worse than death. There's unbelief. That's brought out verse 15. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Can you imagine somebody saying that? Not there at the death of their, of their friend? <laughs> to the intent that ye may what? Believe. Believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> you don't see the whole picture, I know. And, of course, we have the Jews and Martha and Mary. And they run to Jesus. Oh, if you would have, if you just would have been here, this had not happened. That's not true. That happens not to be true. In verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha gives a great theological answer. You'll find that answer in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, how that God will raise up those, those believing saints. Uh, you know, the, the old song, bones and bones and dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's what she's referring to, and that's not what he's referring to. And then we have one of those revealing I am's, and that famous verse we all know and like to quote. But the problem is that last statement with the question mark. Believest thou this? And we have um, a, another tremendous answer. She says unto him, verse 27, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. But that isn't what he asked her. He didn't ask her that. That's, that's, that's a, a great acclamation. Peter said something like that. Who, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But that isn't what he asked her. He said, I am resurrection and life right here, right now. And they're not quite getting it. And oh, the grief at this tomb. Now, I'd like for you to turn over uh, for a minute to look at verse 39. Jesus grieves. It's so the shortest uh, verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. There's a lot of commentary on this. I don't believe it's due to bereavement because Jesus knew he's going to raise him up. So I, I just don't go along with that. It isn't logical thinking. It would be for us, okay, but it wouldn't be for him. <laughs> um, uh, he, he was, and it was his friend, and that's true. Uh, I appreciate that, but um, that I don't. I don't go along with that. If you read the whole context, he already told his disciples. Well, I kind of glad I wasn't there. You know, I'm, I'm sure that had to come across callous to, to to people, right? Now, notice, if you will, please, in verse. Um, let's back. Let's see. Let's start right here in verse 38. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself. Cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. What? Uh, you just didn't do that in, in that culture. 
out of the question. And that Jewish culture holds that today. They wash the body and bury it that day. They still do that. Um, that that's just something you didn't do. And what an insult. And you notice, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days. This is going to be appalling. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I think that's an interesting statement. Have you ever thanked God for hearing your prayers? Now, we've got all kinds of unbelief swirling around the, this situation with Lazarus in the tomb, with our Lord and his delay of coming. Uh, there's a lot going on here. And our Lord stops in the middle of all of this and gives thanks to the Father that he hears prayer, that he hears his prayer. And notice this next affirmation. I know, I knew that thou hearest me when. Always. Um, I, I love John 17. It's one of my favorite chapters of the Bible because it shows the love relationship between the Father and the Son. Um, this relationship was perfect. It was a perfect relationship. And you see what our Lord thanks God for. When I hear, you hear my prayers, and you hear me always. Um, that also ought to, ought to let us know that God hears all we say always. Did you know that? He's a part of every conversation, every communication. He knows your thoughts before you think them. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? Um, notice, if you will, please, I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people who stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast what? What's that tell you? <laughs> they didn't believe. He asked them, believest thou this? What was their answer? More of the same. If you read through the, the, the chapter uh, and you see the Jews, and oh boy, they used to have, um, they would pay people to come in and mourn. Yeah, they did. And I mean, they, they really made an event out of these funerals, so to speak. Well, Jesus is going to unfuneral the funeral. <laughs> Believest thou this? And what do we have? Unbelief, staunch unbelief. So much so, um, and with the Jews, you find out here later, they wanted to kill Lazarus, take away the proof of the power of resurrection. I, uh, that had to be, I, you know, try to, try to understand. Look, imagine if we were following Jesus, we go into a graveyard, and he opens that thing up and brings a guy out of there. I mean, that uh, beyond it be hmm? yeah now you're, you're catching on <laughs> yeah we got to get rid of the proof he said he's a resurrection and life and <laughs> sure enough if he didn't raise the dead what are we going to do now oh boy the whole the, the, all of israel's going to follow him now he has power over the dead well, he told him that he did. He says, I am resurrection and life. He told him in the first place. They shouldn't have been shocked. And notice with you will, and when he had thus, thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot in grave clothes, and his face was bound with a cloth. And Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Get him out of them things. He don't need them. Uh, 
thanksgiving. This is what Jesus Christ is thankful for. That thou hearest me and hearest my prayers and hear and you hear them always. God hears your prayers. You're his child. You're his child. You're in him and he's in you. And um, God hears the prayers of the saints. That's something we can be thankful for, I believe. God's revelation is something we can be thankful for. It's interesting to me where we find Jesus stopping and giving thanks. What about the thanksgiving of Jesus? What would he be giving thanks for? Look in the book of Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I, I want you to notice these are not the, um, the best circumstances. Um, if you look in chapter 11, verse 20, Then began he to upbraid the cities in which most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. We, we don't see Jesus give, Oh boy, thank you Lord for all that came and were saved, and all is going so well. And, uh, no, no, no. No, no, we're, we're swarmed with unbelief at the, at the graveside of Lazarus, at the, at the death of Lazarus. Unbelief everywhere. Not one soul really believed that he is who he says he is. After all they've seen, after all they've heard, now he's done all of these, these mighty works, miracles, preaching, and they would not repent. They would not repent. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, I want to tell you, that is one big um, insult. Tyre and Sidon, that were, those were enemies of Israel that came in and plundered them and did awful wicked things to them. And he's saying, they would be better off than you. Um, and, he, and notice, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for, size, uh, for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to Hades. For if mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, he would have remained under this state. Now these are, you know, I don't know where some of these preachers and some of this stuff I hear. The sweet Jesus. I want to tell you something. The Lord didn't run around and tickle ears. So, to be compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, really? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you want, I don't think you would want that. But I say unto you that it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Yes, sir. It just struck me, this old paragraph here, kind of similar to our present COVID situation, is it not? In what way? Well, God gave all of these researchers and doctors mm -hmm. and really genius type people the ability to figure out how to save people. Yes. And how many people don't believe. Well, is that a common human trait? Unfortunately, is I could show you in the book of Revelations the awful things that's going to happen in the judgment, and they know it, and yet they will not repent. As I as I introduced earlier, unbelief is worse than death. Yeah, amazing. Unbelief is death. Think about it. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God shall not see life, and the wrath of God abideth upon him. And what does God require? Only believe. Only believe. <laughs> All right. Now, verse 25. Uh, you'd be surprised, uh, Walter, the people I get in my vehicle... 
um, the, uh, the company that I drive for, Uber, insists on the mask. Um, they're going to follow the, um, oh, what's the name of them? CDC. CDC guidelines. And before I can even get on the app, I have to agree that I will be wearing my mask. I can't even, they won't even let you on. And I would wear it anyway because common sense tells you you don't know who you're in there with. And, and uh, it's funny to me because, uh, and this just goes along with your point, uh, I'm told of around 50% have not been uh, inoculated, right? But everybody that gets in my car, oh, I've got my shot. Now, that can't be right. <laughs> not every one of them. That can't be right. <laughs> they just don't want to wear it, you know. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, you're right, it is. Unbelief is natural, unfortunately. Now look in verse 25. In the midst of all of this, these great mighty works have been done. In, right in their midst, right in front of them. What does it take? Uh, it kind of reminds us of Israel, doesn't it? Forty years, they never had to go get food once. It was it was brought to them. Right. If you think DoorDash is a new idea, God had that going on in the, in the desert, in the wilderness, <laughs> for 40 years. No, 80 years, right? 80 years. They went around again. Manna in the morning, and the meat brought by the bird in the evening, their shoes never wore. Didn't need a, didn't need a what's that shoe store over there on Pickway Shoe Mart or something? I don't know what it is. So, oh, is it change? Okay, Sciota, whatever. You know, you no, know you need to have a shoe store. Shoes didn't wear out. That's the way it used to get shoes. I'm sorry, I messed up. All right, so uh, clothes never worn. Water rocks right back there. The rock followed them in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle, in front of them in a cloud by day, fire by night. Now, let's go in the land. Oh, no, we can't go in the land. There's giants in there. <laughs> we can't do that. They're like grasshoppers. The sons of Anix are giants. We can't go in. We just can't go in. We're not going in. In fact, we're going to make us a captain and go back to Egypt. Well, there's a plan. <laughs> I don't know. I think they're going to invite them back and throw them a parade. They got one coming. Yeah, that's a plan. Now, God had to meet them and say, guess what? You're not going in. Be it so as you said. And if you try to go in, I'm going to let them kill you. Unbelief. All right, in the middle of that, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Now that sentence bothered me a little bit um, and I had to look up what that meant the word babes means and don't get the wrong impression here that specific word in its meaning though is most important but don't take it the wrong way it means unsophisticated in mind yet trustful in disposition Unsophisticated in mind, but trustful in disposition. I even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. That was, that was the Father's, that's what the Father wanted. He didn't choose many noble, many wise men after the flesh, right? Right? Uh, he didn't choose when Jesus Christ came, the eternal word. Didn't come through Jerusalem. Didn't come through Rome. Came through Nazareth with a maid and a carpenter. <laughs> the unsophisticated. I've noticed in our society, the more sophisticated we get, the more barbaric people become. I've noticed that. All things are delivered unto me by my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, 
and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Who did he reveal himself to? Well, the Pharisees, the scribes, the conquerors of Rome. No, he revealed himself unto fishermen, unto shepherds in the field. That's who he reveals himself to. And that's all part of God's scheme. You remember when they despised the children and God brought a little child and he set them in the midst and he said, if you had the faith of a little child. That's who God reveals himself to. Um, and, that's what the, and that's what Jesus Christ, in the midst of all of this, they would not repent and that's what he gives thanks for. Whom God chooses to reveal himself to. All right. Let's look further, because this gets a little more interesting by the minute, actually. If you'll go back in the book of Mark, chapter 8. These are the recorded thanksgivings of Jesus Christ. Mark, chapter 8. I think about all I'm going to be able to do is introduce this but uh, this morning, but I, I hope that it will get you to think. Uh, isn't it interesting what Jesus Christ thanks for? I mean, there could be all kinds of things he could think. Uh, he could be thanking God for all the power and all the wisdom, and that's not, what, that's not the thanksgivings that go up. And it never seems, the thanksgiving never seems to go up when everything's all positive and nice and going well. Quite the opposite. Mark 8. In those days, verse 1, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because... They have been now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for some of them came from far. Um, you, you, I, I appreciate this picture. Our Lord has compassion on the multitude, even concerning the physical thing. I don't want them falling apart on the way home. <laughs> That's what, it's, that's what he's saying here. That wouldn't be right. And his disciples answered him, From where can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the world? How are we going to do that? What do you want us to do? We're in a wilderness here. That's fair, isn't it? Think about it. We're in a, well, okay, we get that, but <laughs> we're in a wilderness here. All right, now, now notice, if you will, please. Um, and he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, well, seven. And he commanded the people to sit on the ground, and he took seven loaves and gave thanks and broke it and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fish, and he blessed and commanded them to set also before them. And they did eat and were filled, and they took up the broken pieces that were left, seven baskets. Seven, the number of perfection. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Here he gives thanks. 4,000 people, and by the way, that didn't count women and children. So we don't know. You, know, you could easily multiply that by three or four. Okay? Um, that, so that'd be what? 16? Yeah. 16,000 people out in the middle of a wilderness. You got seven loaves and a couple of fish. Now, what do you call that? Well, you call that a miracle. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no other explanation. You cannot feed 16,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a couple of fish 
it can't be done, right? <laughs> oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it can. In the right hands, it can. And he thanks God and he blesses it. That's where Thanksgiving's given. In an incredibly and tremendous, impossible situation. Let's look in the book of John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We have a like idea, but this one's a little different. This one's a little different. In this section, there's a little bit more going on in that uh, the people and his disciples have a grand scheme to make him king and rise up against Rome and become great like the kingdom of David again. That's what's on their minds. And that's not what Jesus is there for. It's not time for that. But notice, if you will, in John chapter 6, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on those that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Notice how John puts that. It didn't say the Passover of the Lord, does it? Same with chapter 2, right? The Jews' Passover. <laughs> and Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him. And he saith unto Philip, where, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now remember, he's performed this before with 4,000. It's a test question. We're told that. It's a test. And this he said to what? Sure. And he himself knew what he would do. And that Jesus was asking because he needed direction from Philip. <laughs> and he don't need Philip's direction or suggestions. But Philip needs faith. Mm -hmm. Philip needs faith. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii's worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. If we, he went to what? Well, he went to the ATM. And he says, I don't think we got enough here. The funds. The funds, if we had this many funds, we couldn't do it. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here who hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Wait a minute, he's done this before. Well, instead of 16 plus, it's 20, we'll say 20,000 plus. Maybe it's, it was because there was more people. I don't know. Then said Jesus, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given what? Thanks. He's giving thanks. For five barley loaves and a couple of fish and... Yeah, he gave thanks. Because that's all God needs. It isn't what man can do with it that matters. Because man's not sufficient. They're not all, man is not all sufficient. God is all sufficient. Remember the test question. And remember how it was answered. He said that to what? Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now understand there's a couple other things going on here. They were an area that Philip came from. And Philip knew that the resources and funds and etc. were not accessible in that area. He knew that he was from there. But notice, if you will, in verse 7, in his answer, uh, if we had this much money of bread is not sufficient. We have insufficient funds. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the all-sufficient God. He forgot who he was talking to. <laughs> and 
And Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks. Verse 11, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them were sitting down, and likewise the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, now this wasn't a meal, okay, you take what, what you can get here, and uh, you make do. No, these people were filled. The, the scripture bothers to tell us that. And, and notice, and, and he, he said unto his disciples, gather up the remain. We got leftovers. We got leftovers. Uh, nothing's to be lost here. Therefore, they gathered together them together and filled 12 baskets full with the fragments of the five barley loaves. And notice how that's stated. We, uh, we not only went from just five barley loaves, we went and filled everybody, and we got 12 baskets full left from the five barley loaves. You see, you can't calculate an all-sufficient God. God determines what's sufficient. And notice, if you will, uh, that remained over and above that which they had eaten. Then those men, when they, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth. That prophet that should come into the world. That goes back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 15. The prophet. This must be the prophet. And frankly, that's still swinging mighty low. He's far more than that. And Jesus goes on in this chapter. Later he says, Labor not for the food which perisheth, but for that food which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed there's, remember the manna from heaven? Those people died. This bread, this bread, you eat, you never die. He's that bread. He's the bread from heaven. Okay. All right. Let's look in the book of, um, I think I skipped one. I apologize for that. Uh, we can look in Luke twenty two nineteen for a moment. We'll just pick this up real quick. Luke chapter twenty two. Nineteen to twenty. This one we're very familiar with. The days of unleavened bread, the Passover. And Jesus has sent his disciples to make ready the Passover in the upper room. This one we're familiar with. Look in chapter 22 and in verse 19 and 20. First, he takes these 12 apostles and he has the Passover with them. And the promise that uh, this will be done again in, in heaven in the kingdom. Then verse 19, and he took bread. And what? And broke it. Well, you say, well, yeah, he, he blessed the bread. Wait a minute. Don't, don't, don't get the wrong idea here. It goes far deeper than that. He's not asking blessing for dinner. That's not what he's doing here. That bread represented his broken body. He's instituting this table before the cross. Just as he instituted the Passover long before the law in Egypt. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, we take that all for granted because we're, what, 2,000 plus years post to this. But understand, the disciple, this hasn't happened yet. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to sit on the left hand, who's going to sit on the right. Uh, you know, their minds, uh, he's talking about what? The divine sacrifice. His body that would be broken. His blood that would be shed. 
He himself being the sacrifice for sins that taketh away the sin of the world. He is introducing the commemoration before the event. And he is doing it how? With thanksgiving. Who's he thanking? God the Father. This is God's will. He's giving thanks. And notice in verse 20, Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is what? He gave thanks. How many of us would give thanks for those things? In everything, what? Now, we've had some events here in the last couple of years in this church. And uh, I just had a little event. And I've I got to admit to you, uh, Thanksgiving wasn't my first reaction. You know, I was talking to Mike Brunk the other day because we were talking about Tuesday. And I said, I learned something about medical people. When they're yelling at you and they're instructing you, you know how they get in your face a little bit and this is what you need to do. And so you know you're in trouble. When they just stand there and look at you with that look, you're over your head. <laughs> it's when they don't talk to you. That's what you have. Now you're really in trouble. <laughs> I learned that. Because um, uh, we had a moment there. And uh, I didn't realize how bad it was until he, he kind of informed me. He says, I don't know whether we're going to be able to keep this leg or not. Here at a critical point. You've got poison in there. You've, uh, you've got three uh, blood clots. Your, your sugar's clear through the roof. I don't know what we're going to do. You're at a critical point. Now go get your blood taken, and we'll see you in the emergency room tonight. <laughs> um, uh, I got to admit, man, Thanksgiving wasn't my first knee jerk reaction. I got I got to confess that. It was, oh boy, what are we going to do now? That was my first reaction. <laughs> um, but in everything, give thanks. Why? Well, because of who God is. Not what we're capable of. That was Philip's problem. Well, if we go to the ATM and we get so many denarii, that's not going to, that's not sufficient. But God is sufficient. We are not able, but he is able. When we have God in the equation, we can always give thanks for everything. Why? He always hears our prayers. He is who he says he is. He said, I'm resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall what? Do you believe that or don't you? Let's feed 5,000. What do you say, Philip? Well, now, can't, that can't be done. <laughs> Let's feed uh, the 4,000. Well, now, how can we do that out here in the wilderness with only, uh, with this, what, what was it? Five barley loaves and two fishes? <laughs> Can't do that. Can't do that. Um, where would you, do we see Jesus Christ giving thanks? I thank God that you've revealed not, yourself not to the wise and prudent, but to who? The unsophisticated and yet believing. That's thanksgiving with Jesus Christ. That's where he gives thanks. Uh, he's our master. Are we, are we greater than our master? We're supposed to be his followers. Are we greater than he? Here he commemorates his own death, knowing. Remember now, even though he's in a, a sinless human flesh, he knew all things as God. He's every wit God, every wit man. He knew what this meant in every way. And he what? 
What's the first thing he did? He gave thanks. He gave thanks. Um, let me show you the duty of the believer priest. Look in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. And let's look in the last chapter of Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 13. We, uh, we many times take the wrong seat. We take on the wrong, uh, the wrong vocation. Uh, I remember when I was supervising in the warehouse... And uh, these guys would, would be, uh, they get a little overrun, and they, they go ask a friend to come over and help them. Oh, that, that's not their job. Their job is to be out on the floor collecting cardboard, not back there helping you clean a restroom. And it's my job to let you know that's not your job. <laughs> that's my job. That's my job. Don't go taking things on that, that have nothing to do with you. See? See? We do that. We have to figure it out, right? It ain't going to be right unless I take the bull by the horns, right? <laughs> I'm get it right. You'll mess it up. Your job is to thank God for who he is. Your job is to thank God all the time. Notice in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Uh, I had a friend of mine come to me last, uh, I was in a prayer meeting up in Westerville on Wednesday, and he came to me and he said, we, uh, we don't have this document. And I said, well, I, I know that. I know, I know we, we don't have the document. He said, well, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to wait on the Lord. He's got, he already has the answers. You're asking the wrong guy here. I don't have the answers. I'm going to do what's required of us to do, as Leona found out. <laughs> and in a hurry, may I say. Um, and we, we, okay, this is what they want. We give them that. But then turn around and work and get all upset. What, what do you, what, you're taking on that which is not your department. No panic. no panic. Send it in. Forget about it. It's going to be God's will. Maybe it's God's will. We don't go to the DRC. Get over it. Then we don't go. But what are we going to do? What we're going to what, what, see, see, we're going to do it. No, we are not sufficient for any of that. It still may not get done. I don't know. But that's not my job. That's way above me. I don't have anything to do with that. I can't open borders. I can't make officials do what they're supposed to do. We once had a king tell us to put a, build a church once. I wanted nothing to do with Africa after the first trip. I pretty well settled it in my mind. I can't wait to get on the plane and get back home. And anybody who comes to these crazy places has lost their ever-loving mind. I'm really going to pray for them. I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm sorry. I have to confess that. What made me change my mind is that I had to go meet the chief, and the chief said, no, you're building a church here because the king said so. <laughs> and um, I didn't take that the way he meant it. I took it the other way. <laughs> the king said so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll be building a church here. And then I was foolish just enough to say, well, all right, I give in. Uh, for 10 years, we'll... Um, uh, we'll put these guys together, get a church dedicated. We'll be done. We've done our part in the mission field. Well, no, we were asked to go to the DRC and then over to Kenya. And I thought, oh, no, okay. <laughs> Swore I wouldn't go to either one of those countries. So I've quit doing that. The last time I went through Rwanda, had the most terrible attitude. The Rwandans really work us over. And they, lo they love to exploit. And I thought, okay. And I thought, here we go. And uh, you have to go pay them money. And then they give you, uh, basically, it's a pass, which you don't need. You, but they're going to make you pay to go through their country. And so I thought, and uh, that was the same guy. Somehow they remember me, these guys. But anyway, he says, uh, I was going to kind of go in another line. I had trouble with him before. And I thought, oh, that's worth it to go at 11 backwards. 
So I, I started to move. He said, no, no, pastor, come this way. And I thought, <laughs> I really don't want to deal with this guy. Not this one. And he says, uh, you've come back. I said, yeah, okay, beat me up. What do you want to do here? I got to go to the Congo. Would you come and preach at our church? I couldn't believe it. My ears about fell off. Oh, this is the guy from Rwanda. Rwanda. Yeah. The head official. Had trouble with him uh, every year. And, um, he, and we couldn't do it because I wouldn't have been able to make the border by evening. And we just couldn't do it. We had a program set in Congo. I just I couldn't have done it. And I thought, yeah, I was wrong. It's not my job to, to do. My job is to give the gospel. Wherever we go, who am I to avoid people? I don't have a right to do that. That's not what God sent me to do, right? Okay, I hope we're seeing this. Now, chapter 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God when we get around to it. That is the fruit of our lips giving... Oh, wait, that isn't what it says. <laughs> when we feel like it. When we want to. No, the believer priest's job, and this is all of us in the room. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Would that be in every situation all the time? Yeah. I think continually would cover that, yes. And who do we have as the perfect example? The great high priest. He's given us the example of how to give thanksgiving. Them's pretty high standards. Now I know this doesn't fit the holiday tradition stuff, and, and I'm sure that preachers are going to have fun with that this Sunday. But this is what God's idea of thanksgiving is. It is a sacrifice to be performed continually. Not once a year with a table full of turkey. I like turkey. Don't get me wrong. Like Thanksgiving. I like to eat. That's unfortunate. That's gotten me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> However, that is not what God's idea is. And we're going to look at the Old Testament next week. By, we're going to have communion next week, Vanna. Because I can't be here December. Oh, okay. That'll be part two of this. We're going to go back in the book of Leviticus and look at what a offering of thanksgiving is. So we'll have it on the 28th, and that'll be the Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's Ben's fault. He was worried about communion, so I had to solve it. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a lie. I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I am. You haven't figured that out yet, yes? Okay, so... When we're looking at Thanksgiving, we need to understand God's idea of Thanksgiving. And we go to Leviticus, we're going to see Thanksgiving connected to the peace offering. That peace offering is Jesus Christ. He is our peace offering mm -hmm. to slay sin and to... Bring us back, reconcile us thoroughly unto God. So we'll be looking at that together. So when Jesus Christ was giving thanks concerning the body that was to be broken and the blood that was to be shed, he was fulfilling that old Levitical code of thanksgiving offering the, attached to the peace offering that God would provide. That's thanksgiving with God. Okay, let's end with a word of prayer, please. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the thanksgiving that was offered to you today. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the body that was broken, the blood that was shed, the cup that was taken, the revelation to the unsophisticated but those of believing disposition. We thank you this morning that he is the resurrection and the life right here, right now. Father, we 
We thank you for the rejoicing Christ in that revelation to us. As we see even with Daniel, that he thanks the God of heaven because it's the God of heaven that reveals, not men. And Father, we thank you that we can enter that rest by ceasing from our own labor and all that we labor for in the Lord. Father, we pray that you would bless us this morning. And Father, as we grace our Thanksgiving tables, may we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for one another as we heard resound today and the great work and service you've given us to do here. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Oh, I gave you all an email uh, update about John Lavelle. And this is something to be thankful for, too. This man that I think his family got called in three times somewhere around over the summer, July, August. He's now walking. Now, he needs a little assist. They had a home health aide there uh, helping him. But he's walking now. All right, let's end with the song of praise. Um, all page 10. This won't take long. Page 10. We'll end with that. We got a minute left or so. Page 10. Okay. Let's stand with Walter and Ben. <laughs> all right. Page 10. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, his loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Okay, see you Tuesday. See you on Tuesday. And he's, uh... <clears throat>